In mid-May 1986, Ligasov celebrated his first triumph at Chernobyl. The radiation and temperature levels decreased. The disaster was seen as localized. The scientist did his job and could now go home. But for some reason, Ligasov decided to stay. It was no use telling him not to go. Even my mother didn't try to persuade him, not because she didn't want to, but because she knew it was useless. He had an excessive sense of responsibility, which he inherited from his father. Responsibility for us, for mom, for colleagues, for the country. He saw himself as part of the country. In his childhood years, Valery Ligasov was indeed a keen child. His old school still has his records, full of top marks. The principal once said, this boy will become either a well-known scientist or a politician. There was never a time when he couldn't answer a question. It seemed he knew everything. He studied things not for the sake of a good grade, but because he wanted to know. Ligasov transferred this model onto his own family. He could discuss serious subjects with us little kids. It was very interesting because, on the one hand, it was weird. And on the other, he asked a question so that we ourselves had to find the answers. He wasn't a very tender or sentimental father. But he taught us to think, that's for sure. Ligasov's rise through the career ranks was something special at the time. A member of the Presidium of the Academy of Sciences at the age of 49, the deputy head of the country's main institute of atomic energy, the Kurchatov, the recipient of multiple awards. So many achievements by the age of 50 was unprecedented. Ligasov found his place in the elite of Soviet science. As a result, he was often envied and even disliked in his circle for being too successful. By 1986, he had all possible state awards, except for the highest civil honor, the hero of social labor. He was meant to receive the Geroy Sotstruda award automatically when he turned 50. That was natural for scientists in those times. But the Chernobyl blast changed these plans. In summer 1986, a strong wave of criticism from European countries hit the Soviet Union. They accused Moscow of concealing information about the disaster, which led to nuclear contamination of the whole area. The Kremlin understood that the country's reputation had to be saved. A special team from the Kurchatov Institute compiled a special report about the causes and scale of the fallout to be presented to the world's main nuclear watchdog the International Atomic Energy Agency. Ligasov was responsible for this report. A bunch of people practically lived in our house during the compilation of this report. People came and went, brought some papers, numbers, stayed overnight. There were sheets of writing lying all over the house. Many people took part in the compiling of this report. And my father insisted on double-checking all of the figures. He insisted that every word must be the truth. Valery was not a specialist in nuclear reactors and not a high-ranking politician. But nevertheless, in August 1986, he traveled to Vienna to face a task which many thought of as impossible, to save his country's face. Given Europe's strongly negative stance on the Chernobyl disaster, it was more like another battle rather than just a public statement. He came to the IAEA headquarters to confront the predators from nuclear physics. People who knew everything on the issue, people who could not have been lied to or couldn't have been tricked. He had to speak the truth, keep in mind which country he represented. And I remember that I asked the, the Soviet embassy, uh, how long will he speak? Because we were planning the logistics and we were having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from all around the world. And I said, they, they said, well, maybe three or four hours. Ligasov read out the 400-page report and survived a three-hour Q&A session. 
The world's top 500 experts in the nuclear field asked him questions, which he gave full answers to. In the end, he received a standing ovation for his efforts. It was yet another triumph. His country's name had been cleared, and Ligasov was ranked in the world's top 10 scientists. He made absolutely infuriated people understand. Yes, we have this disaster, but now let's work together and try to prevent such disasters from ever happening again. Here was the period when the Glasnost be began, the Perestroika and the Glasnost. And, uh, and the Western world was stunned then that here comes someone who speaks freely. Legasov was very sincere and he was very knowledgeable. He was just uh, confident in telling the truth as he knew it. Back in Moscow, a triumphant Legasov was nominated for the Hero of Social Labor Medal. But on the day, he brought back a watch. He and his team had been denied the country's highest award. I think it was personal. The staff at the institution were afraid that he would become their boss, and given his reformative nature, would change everything. His ideas weren't met with support. Meanwhile, the effects of the radiation on Ligasov's body were starting to show. His health deteriorated rapidly and he went into hospital. His family feared it was cancer. He was seriously ill. During the last few months, he practically didn't eat or sleep. Can you imagine how hard it is for someone not to sleep at all? He had strong radiation sickness. Meanwhile, in Chernobyl, scientists managed to get inside the damaged reactor and broke the news that no traces of radioactive fuel had been found inside. We drilled a hole in the reactor and saw that it was empty. Only air. No sand and asbestos from helicopters, no filters, and the helicopters had missed the target, hitting everything but the reactor. It emerged that a second explosion was not going to happen, that bombarding the reactor with burr and lead was useless, and that the helicopter pilots had died for nothing. It turned out that Ligasov had made a serious mistake. We did extinguish the blaze. Secondly, we did manage to lower the level of radiation. Hundreds of times lower. So it means we didn't just do it for nothing. On August the 29th, 1987, Ligasov attempted suicide while in hospital. Doctors managed to save him, and he soon returned to work. The scientist threw himself into finding out what had caused the Chernobyl disaster and ways of preventing anything like this from happening again. He started gathering information about all of the technological disasters in the world, why they had happened, and in particular, he tried to work out a certain algorithm for humanity to minimize critical situations. And not only in the field of nuclear energy, but in the whole of the industrial sector. The scientist urged the government to create an institute of technological risk and security and wrote an article entitled My duty is to let everyone know. He criticized the Soviet nuclear reactor building scheme, lashed out at poorly qualified personnel, ruled that nobody cared about nuclear security in the Soviet Union and that Chernobyl could have happened much earlier. The profound communist Legasov lashed out at something untouchable, the Soviet system. Though it was pretty much perestroika style, the article did not pass the census and wasn't published. He asked me once, what do you think about perestroika? Well, back then I was young and didn't understand everything. I said, yes, it's excellent, we need changes. And then he looked at me and said, Yes, it's good, but I'm not sure that it is being done by the right people. However, for a second time, Ligasov was nominated for the Hero of Social Labor Award. His colleagues congratulated him. Everyone was sure that this time he would definitely get it. But again, he wasn't on the final list. I asked, 
Why was Legasov deprived of the award? I was told that, as far as he was the deputy head of the institute which created the exploded reactor, people wouldn't understand it if he was given this award, as if the institute was to blame. He never thought about doing anything for the sake of another award. He didn't feel heroic about his actions. He was just doing his job. Legasov made one final push. He worked out a plan to create a special council, which would deal with the stagnation in Soviet science and reform it. On April the 26th, 1988, the second anniversary of the Chernobyl blast, he presented it to the Academy of Sciences. The plan was not approved. Legasov came back home feeling devastated. The next morning, his son found him hanged in his Moscow apartment. One of the Soviet Union's highly acclaimed scientists had allegedly committed suicide. His widow later said that her husband was brave and strong, but that he had been destroyed. And so I was called up by the Institute's management and was told to check his belongings for radiation. I went to his office and laid everything out on the table. I turned on the meter and it showed radiation levels. And it continued to just beep and beep. I said his belongings must be destroyed. The scientist lost his final battle. He did not become the head of the institution he had designed and did not publish all of his work but he eventually succeeded in the most important of his goals. Nowadays, there is no alternative to nuclear energy. And that, I believe, should reconcile Legasov's spirit. He and his generation created a fundamental basis for the development of nuclear energy. The lessons of Chernobyl have been learned. Nowadays, nuclear power stations all across the planet pay special attention to safety. Take the Tanwan nuclear facility in southeastern China, for instance, which was recently described by the International Atomic Energy Agency as the world's safest. Engineers say that even if a 20-ton aircraft crashes into the facility, the reactor would stay unharmed. But it's also well protected against any kind of human error. Valery Legasov was buried among the country's elite at the Novodevichy Cemetery in Moscow. A short obit in a newspaper said that Soviet science had suffered a great loss. In 1996, he was posthumously awarded the Hero of Russia medal, and his school was named after him. Alexander Baravoy, who was a so-called Chernobyl liquidator, is now fighting to declassify what is believed to be a top-secret archive which holds a compilation of documents made by Ligasov. They tell the real story of Chernobyl and the true situation within the first few hours of the disaster. Bravoy says it could prove invaluable for the prevention of future such incidents, so that there will never be another Chernobyl.